I'm going to pray that we can get through today smoothly because <laughs> we had some complications last time. But, um, yeah, I'm going to quickly pray us in. It's 1010 so that we can just start. Father God, thank you for this day and everything that's headed our way. God, we pray that every step we take is ordered by you. Nothing happens without your knowledge. Father, please protect us and guide us every step of the way. And please provide for us and make a way in impossible situations. The word declares, if God is for us, who can be against us? With God, all things are possible. I ask that you open up every single person's eyes, hearts, and ears to the word today so that they may be able to meditate on the word later on today, Father God. Amen. It's a quick, simple prayer. <laughs> um, and we're going to dive right in quickly. Let me just check comments real quick. I didn't even open it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. I'm just trying to open it up on my computer because I don't have the comments going while I'm actually on my phone. Um, what is going on? It's always something, I tell you. Okay. So we're diving into chapter two of Esther. I have all of my utensils, of course, you guys know the usual, the Sharpie highlighters, Crayola super tips, as well as the Crayola twistable colored pencils. My Pentel pen, it's the RSVP in the 0.7 fine point. I love it. Um, 0.7s, 0.5s are my favorite kind of pen to write with. And this is still not opening on my computer. I don't know why. But I do have some new highlighters I want to show you guys. Because I'm going to try them out today in these Bibles. I'm pretty sure they're going to bleed. But um, I still wanted to try them out. So I have this one here. Um, it's the Pilot Friction Soft Color Highlighters. Um, they are erasable. So I wanted to try these out. They're pastel colors. And I got this off of Amazon. And then I have these which are the Zebra Mild Liners. Um, in their three packs, this is the fluorescent. Um, I don't even know which pack this is. This one is the warm, and I think this one is the cool. But um, those are the colors, and I did swatch it for you guys. So this pack is the uh, cool pack. This is the warm pack, the fluorescent. This is comparing it to the Sharpie highlighters as well as the highlighters I get from Dollar Tree. And then this is the pastel pack from Pilot Friction compared to the Pilot and the highlighters I get from my local Dollar Tree or discount store. So I'm going to try these out. Um, I'm really hoping these work out good in the um, Bible because I really want to use them in the Bible. And they are erasable as you can see. But yeah, I'm just showing you guys because I know there are some new people who join us and don't always know what I use. So we're going to dive in. Just get my computer gently, gently. Yeah, I have to move my computer gently because it is still not. I still don't have a new one, so my computer can easily just shut off anytime. You're welcome, Don. Yes, Tasha, I'm always, like, trying not to sing the songs out so loud because I love listening to the music. <laughs> Probably one of my favorite songs so far is um, Live Through It. Which one's LaToya? Um, the... Okay, so I know the Pilot Frictions, this three-pack, I, I mean, not the Pilot, the Zebra Mild Liners, I got in a three-pack off of Amazon for about, thir basically, $14. Um, I'm, I have prime shipping, so it came in two days and shipping was free. Um, the Pilot Frictions, uh, they were less than $10, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going to eat, yeah, I believe they were less than $10. If I can find links to them, um, actually, I will find the links to them and then post them in the group. But um, they weren't expensive at all, so. Alright, so I have my notes ready. I did this during this 
study I definitely do do my notes ahead of time because I know I don't want them to be too long when we're doing these lives and um, hopefully this is zoomed in enough for you guys I wanted to get as close as possible as I could okay so we are going to start off with the first four verses there are only 23 verses in this chapter um, all the chapters are pretty short, so we're going to dive right into this and start off by reading, obviously. So, um, as I'm doing this, if you guys have any questions, comments, um, anything that you think stood out within the verses, definitely share them because I'm open to seeing what you guys thought. So, Esther Chosen Queen. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all, of, in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them. Verse 4, And let the young women who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti this pleased the king and he and he did so sorry okay so I'm gonna circle I think two words in this paragraph and the first one being anger and abated I believe that's all that I wanted to circle in this verse yeah so I do have my um can you guys hear me? I just forgot that I had... I forgot I had my speaker. So let me know if you guys can hear me. Because I totally forgot I had the speaker still plugged to my phone. The speaker does have a mic on it. But um, just let me know if you guys can hear me now. <laughs> but, um, okay. Those are the only two words that I wanted to circle. Um, and of course, you guys probably have your own words that you wanted to circle. I have my large post-it note. And then I have my emoji ones that I wanted to use today. I have this cloud with the rainbow. And then the kissy face. Okay, thanks guys. I, I totally forgot the speaker was plugged in. But thankfully, the speaker comes with a mic in it. So that works out great. Okay. So, um, for anger, I circled it because um, in the Bible, I believe in the King James translation, it says wrath. Let me move these highlighters and open up my Thompson chain reference. Yes, in the King James, it says um, when the wrath of the king, of King Ahasuerus, was appeased. So, um, that's why I circled both anger and abated. And anger is basically a strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility. It's rage or wrath. So that's what I'm going to write. And I'm going to write it up at the top. So I circled anger, and the definition that I'm putting is... And I'm just putting the English definition to um, anger. I'm not going to look it up in Hebrew, because I don't know. <laughs> I feel like it's going gonna, it's gonna to say the same thing, honestly. Um, so, strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility. I'm just going to write wrath. Keep it simple. So that's what I have for anger is strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility, semicolon, wrath. And for abated, it's basically to die down in force or intensity. It stresses the idea of progressive diminishing or subsiding, waning, or decreasing. So... To die down in 
in force or intensity. Did that hurt? <laughs> So those are the two words that I circled, anger and abated, with the definitions. I am going to go in with, I really want to try one of these highlighters. So what I'm going to do is move this out the way without ripping my paper. <laughs> so I'm just taking a note off of here so that I can look on the back and show you guys if it bleeds. And what color do I want to use? I really want to use this pretty gray color. And I also want to use this blue. So I'm trying out the zebra or the zebra mild liners. This is the cool and the warm. So from the cool, I'm going to try out this gray because I just, I'm obsessed with gray. Um... And the thing I like about these are um, they are Japanese styled highlighters, but they have your regular chiseled in. And then unknowingly, they have a second cap here for more of your pointed tip. So I'm going to use a pointed tip for this. For anger. I like that color. Oh, so pretty. And I think this is one this one is called mild smoky gray or something like that. I don't know. What is it called? It is called just mild gray. They all are called different names. Um, but you know. And then from the warm pack, I'm taking what color is this? Mild smoke blue. And I'm going to use the same tip, the fine line, fine liner tip, I guess you would call it. Probably should have used a brighter color because it is a little dark, but that's okay. And um, let's see. So um, it didn't bleed through, but it did shadow. Which doesn't bother me. I boxed the mild blue here and then the gray here. It doesn't really bother me because, I mean, highlighters will bleed through regardless. I mean, you guys can see. I mean, not bleed through, but shadow through. You guys can see here. But um, I think these are really nice. If you use it with a light hand, don't um, be too heavy-handed. Yeah, they're really nice, um, Stacy. Definitely check them out on um, Amazon. You get all three of these in a pack. For fourteen dollars, it was like thirteen dollars and some change. So I'm just saying fourteen dollars. And um, if you have Prime shipping, it's even better. Um, and what I like about them is that you can also buy them individually, like the specific colors you like. So I might go a little crazy and um, order some more of the gray ones because I think the gray one is probably going to be my favorite because it's really pretty. Like it's a really nice gray. And um, I'm going to use these in my Bibles when I'm studying, when I'm reading a book. Like, I'm going to use these everywhere. But, okay. So, we're going to dive right back in. So, underlining now. Yeah, fine tips are definitely hard to find. Uh, definitely. That's why if I get a highlighter, they have to have a really fine chisel. Which is what I like about the Sharpie ones, is that even though it's just a chisel tip, I can still use the tip of it alone as a fine tip liner. Highlighter, I mean. So, they're awesome. So, I'm just moving, swiping the comments out of my way quickly, you guys, <laughs> so that I can get through the first four verses, and then I'll put the comments back on my phone. But, um, okay, so, after these things, which I am going to underline, after these things... When the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. I'm going to underline when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated. Moving on to verse 2. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. I'm going to underline... Uh, 
beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom. I'm going to underline all the provinces of his kingdom. Even though I don't really have a note for that, but I'm going to underline it now. <laughs> um, to gather all the all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them. Verse 4. Let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. I'm going to underline that. This pleased the king, and so he did. And he did so, sorry. I'm going to underline that. So right now, underlined in um, the first four verses, I have, After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, all the provinces of his kingdom, and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti, and then also this pleased the king, and he did so. So that's what stood out to me in the first four verses. Of course, you guys will have something different. I definitely would love you guys to share your photos of what you um, underline. That's awesome, Stacy. I just put the, the comments back on the screen. <laughs> but um, that's awesome. But yeah, I definitely would love you guys to share photos because I love looking um, and seeing you guys' notes and what you get and um, just seeing your progress and stuff like that. It just, I don't know, it makes me really, really happy. But um, <laughs> so after these things, the reason I underline this is because this gives more of um, a historical context of what's going on. And also it lets you know the time frame between chapter one and chapter two. So when I did my research and all that, um, it said that it referred to the time that King Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, spent during his unsuccessful invasion of Greece um, and when he came home defeated, and this was also a four-year time span between Chapter 1 and Chapter 2. So the end of Chapter 1, where they had this decree um, about the man being the master of his household, this was now a four-year time gap because within that time he went to invade Greece, which failed. So, my notes, I'm going to write... Um, So I started off with, um, it's a four year time span between the end of chapter one and the beginning of chapter two. And I'm going to also put unsuccessful invasion of Greece. And the reason why I did that is because this also correlates to, you know, the textbooks and the, the history that we learn in school. Um, obviously, his name is not King Ahasuerus. It's known as King Xerxes in the textbooks. Um, but King Xerxes is King Ahasuerus. So that lets you know that um, it actually just proves that the Bible, the, the events of the Bible are true, basically. So I put four year time span between the end of chapter one and the beginning of chapter two. And um, it was his unaccessible invasion of Greece. And that's just for after these things. That's just giving me some historical context. In the next part when it says when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, um, his anger could have been towards two different things. It could have been towards his obvious defeat during the invasion of Greece, but it also could have been toward the thought of having to find himself a new queen after what King, I mean, what Queen Vashti did. So, um, where can I put that? I'm going to put it here. Anger toward defeat. The 
or an invasion of Greece. I'm going to put and or. So if you guys hear that sound, that is my computer. It's humming really loud. So yeah. So I put anger toward defeat during invasion of Greece and or towards having to find a new queen due to Vashti's foolishness is what I'm going to put. Um, we really don't know what his anger was toward, but you know. Some would argue towards Vashti and some would say towards his defeat. Moving on to the next one that I underline, which is in verse 2. Beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. So the attendants basically wanted to assemble a harem from the most beautiful women of the land to please the king. And that included all 127 regions and um, areas that were in the Persian Empire. Um, so... Verse 2, I'm going to have to write that on a sticky note because I'm not going to have a lot of space. But what I'm going to do first is make my highlights because you guys know when I don't, I get confused. <laughs> um, what do I want to try now? I'm going to stick with these highlighters for today just to test them out because I really do want to see if they're useful in these Bibles. So I'm going to just stick my um, Sharpie highlighters and my Crayolas to the side for now. I'm going to go with this green. And then I'm also going to go, I guess, with this color. Now this green is called, what is it called? That's a good question. This is called Mild Green. It's a really pretty green, but it comes off a lot deeper. It almost looks like a forest green to me. But, um... Then I'm going to go with this color, which is called Mild Red. This is a red highlighter, and I think this is a pretty, pretty highlighter. Yeah, Tasha, I definitely agree. He definitely had to be angry with a lot of things. Because, <laughs> I mean, I think this is when you would have to, like, go into your textbooks and, like, remember your history to understand even more about what happened in Greece with him. Um, and history was not my greatest subject, so I do remember King Xerxes, though, because when it came to learning about the different kings, queens, and the, the different gods and goddesses, that always interested me in um, high school in history, but everything else, I suck that. But yeah, <laughs> I, I really like these colors. Oh my gosh, they're so pretty. I'm just trying to see if it's bleeding. Yeah, it's not bleeding. It does um, show through, though. But it doesn't bother me. So, if it doesn't bother you guys when your highlighters show through on the other side, I definitely would say get these. But I'm um, moving on to the next one. I'm going to use the blue. And over here, I'm going to write verse 2, or V2, rather, you guys know. Verse 2, um, his attendants I feel like I need to buy a bigger table or do this at the kitchen table from now on. <laughs> Because I never have enough space. 
but um oops sorry the attendants wanted to assemble A harem of virgins. To please the king. And um, obviously having a bunch of beautiful young virgins was normal back then. And um, I have a cross reference for this. It is 1 Kings 1 verse 2. That is not where First Kings is, Shanae. Okay. So we're at verse First Kings, sorry. Verse one and two. Therefore his servant says to him, Let a young woman be sought for my king, and let her wait on the king and be in his service. Let her lie in your arms, that my lord the king may be warm. So, um, having a bunch of virgins was pretty much normal for, for the kings. That was normal, so I'm just going to write C, first kings. Chapter 1, verse 2. And when I post the printable, um, all of the cross-references are on it already for you guys. Then I just went back with the highlighter. For this one, I'm going to go in all the provinces, basically 127 regions and districts. All 127 regions and districts. That's a lot of women. That's probably over 300 plus women. Like, he had that many females come to him. And I'm pretty sure it was by force. So I'm just going to go with this color over here. I'm going to try this brown. This brown color from the pack. Um, it is called, what is it called? Mild brown. <laughs> Nothing special. It's called mild brown, but I want to try it. And that is definitely brown. It's a little too dark, so I don't think I would use it in this in my Bibles unless I'm doing something that doesn't have to be like marked over. All right, so moving on to verse four, and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This, in essence, basically would be kind of like what we call a beauty pageant or a beauty contest is what they would hold. Um, so. In essence, a beauty pageant. That's a, like the simplest term that I can put it, what they're having with all of these girls. In essence, a beauty pageant to find the queen. To find new queen. But obviously, there would be more to it than just her beauty because these women would have to have sexual relations with a king so to basically prove that they were virgins in the first place but it's basically a beauty pageant um and then this pleased the king and he did so basically the king is once again acting on his pleasures and um nothing more he's basically a pleasure seeker so i'm just gonna write king is a pleasure seeker because that's what he is. And I said this last week. When I made reference to them um, just drinking. So they basically got drunk. 
Um, I'm gonna go in with this color. It's a pretty purple. It's called... What is it called? <laughs> Mild Violet. I'm gonna use this for the first part. And then I'm going to go in, I'm going to take the Crayola, just because I feel like it right now. Just going to use this pink. Okay. Let me put the comments back to see. So that is that. Moving on. To the next paragraph, we're going to read from verse 5 through 11. Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Yair, son of Shemai, son of Kish, a Benjamite. Right? A Benjaminite. I think it's called a Benjaminite. Yes, I'm going to just say that. Um, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives carried away with... I feel like I want to say Jaconia, so I'm going to say Jaconia. It's probably not pronounced that way. It's probably pronounced with a Y, but um, I'm going to say Jaconia, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, who, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Verse 8. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. Verse 9. And the young woman pleased him in one his favorite. Um, okay, sorry. Let me just reread that. Um, so when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa the citadel and Haggai, in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in the custody of Haggai, who had charge of the woman. Verse 9, and the young woman, the young woman being Esther, pleased him and won his favor, and he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food, and with seven chosen young women for the, from the king's palace, and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Verse 10, Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. Verse 11, and every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what, she, and what was happening to her. Sorry about that, you guys. So, going to start circling things that I want to define. Just checking comments. Okay. Let me see if I can fix this because this is why I'm getting confused. <laughs> Trying to um, write my notes and read and this camera is just like not helping. I'll obviously fix it when I'm um, reading the notes to you guys. But um, so I am going to start off circling... Mordecai's name, if I can get it. So I'm going to circle Mordecai. I'm going to circle Yair. Shemai. Kish. Benjaminite. Um, did I write the definition? No, I didn't. So I'm going to then circle Hadassah. I'm going to circle Esther. Um, and hey guy, but I'm trying to figure out where his name is. Whatever. Hey guy. Okay. So I have Mordecai, Yair, Shemai, Kish, Benjaminite, Hadassah, Esther, and Hegai. Um, circled. So I'm going to break these down. 
starting off with Mordecai and I'm gonna write these over here I'm probably gonna write them on a different post-it just because I don't want it to take up too much space so I'm just gonna write Mordecai Um, so Mordecai is basically a Persian name meaning little man or man worshiper slash follower of Marduk who was the state god of Babylon and um, he was a cousin of Esther and all that I know about his Jewish name is that it did not survive and I'm guessing that's because he chose as well as other Jews to stay in um, Susa so what I'm gonna write is Persian name Meaning little na little man, sorry. Or worshiper slash follower slash man of Marduk. God of, sorry, not a capital G, lowercase g, <laughs> God of Babylon. For Yair, and I always want to say Jair, but it's pronounced Yair. Um, it means... He enlightens or enlightener or enlightener semicolon he is the father of Mordecai so Yair means he enlightens or enlightener in Hebrew and he's a father of Mordecai then we have Shemai. I feel like I'm pronouncing it wrong because I was practicing how to pronounce all of these names. So I still feel like I'm saying it wrong, but I'm going to stick with it. Shemai. And it originates from the word Shama, which means to hear or to have heard or reported. Um, so... Originates from word Shama. Meaning to hear. Reports. Or have heard. And this is the grandfather of Mordecai. And then we have Kish. It's a Hebrew name meaning a bow. So, means like an, a bow and arrow kind of thing. So, it means a bow. Great grandfather. Of Mordecai. And I think that's all I put. Yeah, okay, that's all I put. A Benjaminite. Is a descendant. Of Benjamin. Okay, and then we have Hadassah. 
Now for that, the Hebrew name is um the Hebrew name means a myrtle tree, and it's used metaf metaphorically in the Old Testament for God's forgiveness and recon reconciliation with his people. Her name also reflects the custom of naming daughters after plants and flowers to emphasize their attractiveness and beauty. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to fit all that on here. So let's try. <laughs> and that is not at all straight, um, but whatever. Okay, so again, I said Hadassah means myrtle tree, and it metaphor is metaphorically used for God's forgiveness and reconciliation with his people, which makes sense because Hadassah, who is now Esther, um, basically saved the people of Israel, or the Jewish people. Um, so I have that. We're going to just stick that to the side. And then I'm also going to write... Esther over here. Now, Esther is the Persian name that means star and it's derived from the same root as the principal goddess Ishtar, who was also associated with war, love, eroticism, eroticism and sexuality. So, Persian name There we go. And the last one is Haggai. And um, his name is of Persian origin. And he was basically the chamberlain who was in charge of the harem, rather the virgin harem. So Persian origin Chamberlain in charge of Virgin Harem because the king had two different harems, which you'll find out shortly. Okay, let's highlight. And I'm just gonna use all of my Sharpie highlighters for this. So I'm going to do Hadassah in purple. Let's do Mordecai in yellow. Let's do Esther in pink, which I don't know if that's going to show up on here. Just because... This is pink.
Let's do Haggai in green. Shemai in orange. Yair in blue. Benjamite in this color here. Pale pink or quiche. Okay, there we go. Alright, so now we can get into underlining. So I'm going to underline a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai. I'm going to go to verse 7 and underline he was bringing up Hadassah. And also, beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. Young woman gathered in Susa the citadel in custody of Haggai. I'm going to go to verse 9 and underline the, woman, the young woman pleased him and won his favor. I'm going to also underline he quickly provided for her. Going to verse 10, I'm basically going to underline the whole thing. And then for verse 11, I'm going to underline every day Mordecai walked in front. Um, to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. So that's what I underlined. Um... Good morning, Tanya. Okay. Pulling out my post-it note again. So, for verse 5, I underlined a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai. We already defined Mordecai's name. But, um... This, um, verse 5 and 6 really are giving the background of Mordecai's family for a specific reason, which we can find out more about that in chapter 3 when we get to it. But um, this is just letting me know that Mordecai is from the wave of the Jews that were relocated to Babylonian. Sorry, you guys. He came to Persia in one of the waves of the relocation that the Babylonians imposed on Judah when it conquered that land. So, um, yeah. And it's also revealing the background of Mordecai's family. Um, he is a relative of King Saul, who was the first king of Israel. So I'm going to write all that down. So verse 5 and 6. Well, I'm just going to write verse 5 because I don't really have anything for 6. So verse 5. He came to Persia. In one of the waves, let me write my notes on camera. Um, so he came to Persia in one of the waves, one of the waves of relocation.
that the Bab Babylonians imposed on Judah. When conquered, this reveals. Wait. Yeah, okay. This reveals. background of Mordecai family and I do have scriptures for that um, so I have scriptures relating to verse 5 which is a Jew in the citadel whose name is Mordecai um, it more so relates to his whole family line so I'm gonna go to 1st Samuel First Samuel nine and verses one and two. Um, let me move the post it out the way. So first Samuel nine one and two reads There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of uh, Abio, the son of Zior, um, son of yeah. Basically it's letting you know. Um the, the Benjamin who was Kish, who is his great grandfather and then when you skip to verse 2 it says that Kish had a son whose name was Saul a handsome young man so um basically Mordecai is related to the first king of Israel simply put <laughs> um, and then I also have 2nd Samuel I don't know why I left there so 2nd Samuel 16 verses 5 through 8 right yes 16 verses 5 through 8 okay and this is about Shammai. Um, and it says, When King David came to Bahumer, Bahurim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shammai, the son of Gera. And as he came, he cursed continually. He threw stones at David and all the servants of King David, and all of the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And Shammai said as he cursed. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but basically that's about Shammai and Kish. Who are his grandfather? Shammai is his grandfather, and then his great grandfather is uh, Kish. So I'm going to quickly write these before I sh share with you guys the other cross references. So First Samuel nine chapter, First Samuel chapter nine verses one and two. I have Second Samuel chapter sixteen. Verses 5 through 8. Then I have 2 Kings, which talks about Jeconia from um, verse 6. So, sorry about the shaking of the camera, you guys. 2 <laughs> Kings 24, verses 14 and 15. 14 and 15. So, he carried away all Jerusalem and all the officials and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land and he carried away Draconian to Babylon, the king's mother, the king's wives and his officials and chief men and land. And basically everybody was taken into captivity from Jerusalem. <laughs> um, so that's second Kings 24 and verses. 14 to 15, and then the last cross-reference I have is really information about Jaconia, um, because he was only 8 years old at the time that he was king. So this is an 8-year-old king, um, and that's 2 Chronicles 36, verses 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10. So, Deconia was, oh, sorry, 18. Huh? Okay, so in here it says 18 years old. But um, at the bottom, if you look down, it says most Hebrew, man most Hebrew manuscripts say 8. So, 
I'm not 100% sure about that. I'm going to say 8. He probably was 18. Um, but from my knowledge, when I read the King James, it says that he was 8. So, um, yeah, it says he was 8 when he became king and reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. In the spring of the year, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to the to Babylon. Babylon with the precious vessels of the house of the Lord and made his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem. So I'm going to have to research that because I know in all my other Bibles it says 8, but in this one it says 18. So that's interesting. I'm going to have to um, look that up. But yeah. And um, no worries, you guys. You don't have to keep up with the cross-references. I will put... They are already in the note, the live notes. Really, Paul is a Benjamite? That is really, really interesting. That's quite interesting. Hmm. Thanks for that, Dawn. <laughs> that is really interesting. Um, okay, so... I said I wanted to continue on with these highlighters, so... I'm going to go in... I don't know. I don't know which color I'm going to use, so I'm just going to grab this green for now. This green Crayola. For verse 5. And underline a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai. Okay, so he was bringing up Hadassah. Um, that is verse 7. And um, quick side note, Anne is going to have a word study on the word Esther, and she's also going to be, do be doing a verse mapping for verse 7 as well. So I'll have all that information in the live notes printable for you guys but um definitely keep your eyes out for the word study on Esther and the verse mapping on verse 7 but um he was bringing up Hadassah basically um Esther was essentially an orphan and he raised his cousin and took care of her as his own child so that shows you the love that he has um so Esther orphaned So he raised her as his own. And then also again for verse 7, I have another note. And beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. Basically this is letting me know that Esther was a stunning young woman. She was probably the most beautiful woman out there. Um, no one knows, but from what the Bible is presenting to me as um someone who's reading it yeah see stacy yeah and the in the king james it definitely says eight so i'm gonna have to research that to make sure because even when a lot of the pastors and churches teach they say that he was a young kid he was only eight years old so um gonna have to look at look into that so yeah but um back to what i was saying about the beautiful figure and was lovely to look at um Esther was just beautiful. I mean, she was probably the most beautiful of them all. <laughs> so I, I don't, I under, I underline that because I think it's important to understand, um, especially after defining her name, um, Hadassah, meaning you know myrtle tree, and it's metaphorically used to. Um, where is that note? Oh, here it is. I had to look up my post-it note. So, um, so her name Hadassah means myrtle tree, and it's met metaphorically used for God's forgiveness and reconciliation with His people, which she did as queen. She saved her people. But then the name Esther, um, it means star. A star is very bright. That's number one. And then um, her name is also derived from the goddess Ishtar, and the goddess Ishtar was known for love and war, but she was also associated with eroticism and sexuality so um the fact that esther was this stunning young beautiful woman really makes her names both her hebrew name and her persian name make more sense at least in my opinion i like looking up um the definitions of their hebrew names and the greek names and stuff like that because i always feel like their names associate with who they are as people and it never fails at least when i've done my research so um 
Yeah. She was beautiful. And her personality mixed with both names. Alrighty. Gonna take this. Did I use this one already? I don't know. Did I? I think I did. So we're gonna move along and try out this color here. This is called Mild Gold. So we're definitely gonna use it. And I'm gonna underline and box. Going in with this one, which is Mild Magenta. I don't know why I'm telling you guys the names, but yep, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and then this last one um, I'm going to use for this one, which is in verse 8. Young women were gathered in Susa Citadel in custody of Haggai. Verse 8, it is 11, 11, okay. Whoa. Um, verse 8, basically Haggai was the overseer of the king's harem, and this means that there were over 300 females. So, over 300 plus women given to Haggai Overseer of Virgin Harem. So going on to verse 9, I'm going to go on with this pink pack, which is more of the fluorescent pack. And this one is called Mild Pink. Um, the young woman pleased him. What verse is that? Verse 9. So the young woman pleased him and won his favor. Um, basically, Esther's beauty must have rivaled others around her. God made it so that she could shine more than them to fulfill his plan through her for his people. Hopefully that just made sense. I'll repeat it once more. <laughs> um, so the young woman pleased him and won his favor. So the young woman being Esther and then him being Haggai. So I'll change around the verse to say that Esther pleased Haggai and won his favor. So this is letting me know that Esther's beauty must have rivaled others around her and God made it so that she could shine more than them to fulfill his plan through her for his people. Hopefully that made sense as I said it again. <laughs> so I'm going to write that here. Um, her beauty rivaled others. God made it so she shined right that's what I put right yep shined more than them to fulfill his plan through her 
for his people. Um, and this is basically Esther obtaining the favor of Haggai. Um, Haggai is a man in authority over her. And this basically is her godliness ensured the fulfillment of Proverbs 3, 3, and 4. So I'm going to write, she fulfilled. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 through 4. Let me quickly highlight. I don't know why I'm trying to highlight light pink on that paper, but whatever. And, okay, so for verse 9, um, the young woman pleased him and won his favor. I put her beauty rivaled others. God made it so she shined more than them to fulfill his plan through her for his people. And she fulfilled Proverbs 3, thir um, 3, 3 through 4, which I will read for you guys. So, moving that out the way because I don't need anything to fall. Um, Proverbs 3, 3-4. through 4. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. So Esther basically found favor in the sight of God as well as man because um, she was steadfast in her love and she was faithful. Sorry, you guys. My brain just went left. <laughs> but yeah. Thanks, Dawn. Paul is for Romans 11, 1 and 11. Okay, I'm definitely going to check that out after I'm done with this. But, um, yeah. So, moving on to finish up verse 9. Um, he quickly provided her. I underline that as well. And, basically, because of the favor that she won from him... Um, he gave her special beauty preparations beyond the typical allowance, which then accelerated the process of her beauty treatments, which meant that she was always lovelier than the rest of the girls. So not only was, um, you know, she beautiful because God made her that way, not only did she outshine everyone else, but um, because of the favor that she obtained with Haggai, she now has way more than she should have. Um, which allows her to basically upkeep the way she should look. So she's definitely going to be the most beautiful woman out there because she's already beautiful as it is. So when you put more beauty on top of it, I mean, what else is there? Hopefully that just made sense. <laughs> but um, I'm going to write, Haggai gave her... Gave her a special treatment. And more than the typical allowance. And as people would say, she stayed on fleek. <laughs> Basically, um, she stayed dressed to the nines, however you want to say it, in whatever modern day language or old school language you want to say it. She was always on point um, because she got this special treatment. So she stayed on point. I'm just going to put that. She stayed on point. So going to... Oh, wait. I didn't want that. So... Taking this is called Mild Orange. Again, don't know why I'm telling you guys the names. Not sure why I'm attempting to highlight on these papers, but whatever. I like this orange. Oh my god, that orange is pretty. It's a really pretty orange. I'm probably going to have to order more of these. Just saying. Yes, Tanya. <laughs> As I tell you, when, when you really go in depth and study um, Ruth and Esther, it just is like mind-blowing. Because the first time, I'm going to show you guys quickly my notes. 
actually I'll show you guys at the end what my notes look like the first time I ever studied Esther they look nothing like what it looks like now like nothing you guys like it's it's ridiculous um, it is 11.20. I need to be done by 12.30 because my brother has stuff to do. So, <laughs> I need to move along. Um, so, skipping down to verse 10. Um, had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. I'm going to highlight that in this gorgeous uh, color here. It's called blue-green, but it's really, really pretty. Then I'm going to use this yellow for the last part. Okay. So two points for verse 10. The first point goes with This where it says, had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not, um, not to make it known. Um, this basically shows Esther's loyalty and how she obeys the chain of command in a sense. Mordecai didn't plan for her to permanently conceal her, um, her heritage, but I think he already had insight to wait to reveal it at an opportune time because the Bible also tells us that we should not hide who we are um, or we should not deny Jesus rather to others because then he would deny us. So um, that verse within itself is really just packed with a lot of good stuff. So um, I do have cross references. I think I have three for that. Yes. Um, but the note that I'm going to write for the first part of verse 10 is that... Uh, Esther was loyal and obedient. And then I'm also going to make a note that um, did not plan to permanently. I'm just making sure my notes are correct permanently conceal her heritage um, then I'm gonna write read Ephesians 6 1 Matthews 10 32 33 and then Leviticus 26, 36. So, for verse 10, where it says he had, um, she had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her. I have uh, wrote that Esther was loyal and obedient. Mordecai also did not plan to permanently conceal her heritage because that is against the word of God. And the cross references are Ephesians 6 and 1. So I'm going to flip to that and read it real quick to you guys. Um, six and one at the bottom. Um, I'm actually going to read six, one through three. It says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you, that you may live long in the land. So, I put that as a cross reference because it even tells you in the scripture, if you back up to um, verse seven, where it says he was bringing up Hadassah, the daughter of his uncle, um, as his own daughter basically not only was Mordecai her cousin but she also looked to him as a father figure so she's now obeying him as scripture says um, and then I'm gonna skip to Matthew 10 and 32 sorry if I'm going a little fast here you guys but I do have a time crunch just because my brother needs to um, work and he is a producer and a musician so, um, I have to just speed up a little bit because <laughs> he will get impatient. And I don't want him to blast the music while I am 
going through this with you guys. So, um, yeah, Matthew 10, I said 32 and 33. Where'd it go? Oh my gosh, this piece here. Okay. So 10, 32, 33. Um, here it is. So, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So, um, essentially, if you look at it in um, a sort of theological, I guess, kind of sense, a lot of theologians would question whether um, her hiding her identity was right because it tells us not to do that. But um, I think the whole not making known her identity was a part of God's plan. Um, I think that God gave that sort of hunch to Mordecai for her to withhold it for a time being because her revealing who she was was needed for a specific purpose within God's plan to save his people. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> Um, and then the last one that I have is Leviticus 26 and 36. So let's flip to that. 2636. Where is it? Okay. Um, okay, and as for those of you who are left, I will send faintness into their hearts in the lands of their enemies the sound of a driven leaf shall put them to flight and they shall flee as one flees from the sword and they shall fall when none when none pursues um so i'm mainly focusing on the part where it says i will send faintness into the into their hearts in the lands of their enemies um because he also mordecai could have also told her to um keep her identity hidden because of fear and that fear was actually faintness that god gave to the people um, when they were in enemy land, in enemy territory. So um, you can look at it in so many different ways. But in the end, I feel like Mordecai telling her to keep her um, identity known was basically a part of the plan for God to use Esther to save her people. So um, I just feel like it had more power for her to keep it hidden rather than expose who she was and try to save them. Um, but yeah, moving on to verse 11. Thanks, Tanya. <laughs> I try, I try, I try. Um, I basically tell you guys my thoughts. Um, and even though they are my personal thoughts, my thoughts are also based on facts because I do all the research. Because um, I do find that some people um, do tend to share their thoughts and their thoughts don't always align with scripture. Which is why I tend to have like several different Bibles out while I teach. I go on um, Blue Bible, Blue Bible, Bible Hub, Blue Letter Bible. I Google things. Um, I try to make sure that even though it's my opinion, that my opinion also matches up with the facts and what the scripture says. Because I think that's very key to studying the word of God. Because, I mean, everyone will have different thoughts and different opinions. But um, in the end, we should all also... Uh, kind of have the same thoughts in the end concerning scripture hopefully that just made sense <laughs> but um so verse 11 every day Mordecai walked in front to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her um this just shows that Mordecai has a deep love for his cousin and that even though he followed the king's edict um he's still concerned about his cousin being in, in sort of a dangerous situation so um Shows Mordecai's love. For his cousin. Even though. He followed the king's edict. He was still concerned about her, still concerned about her. Okay, so again for verse 11, it shows Mordecai's love for his cousin even though he followed the king's edict. He was still concerned about her um, because I mean she's now a part of the king's harem. I would be concerned too because you don't know how these women were. 
So, um, I am going to actually just read the last two paragraphs straight through, and um, then I am going to do my definitions and everything like that. I'm trying to see if I defined anything else I did. There are one, two, three, four, six words that I did define. So, reading verse 12 all the way through. Oh, no, I'm sorry, you guys. Nope, I'm just going to read the 12 through 14. Yep, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Hopefully, my brother has patience. But um, it says, Now when the turn came for each young woman to go into King Ahasuerus after being 12 months under the regulation for the women, since this was a regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women, when the young woman went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she would go in, and in the morning she would return to the second harem in custody of Sh 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 Guess I don't. From, I can't remember how to pronounce it. I looked it up this morning and can't even remember. But yep, that person there, um, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and was summoned by name. So I am going to circle uh, beautifying and that word right there, mer. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. And also this person's name because who knows. <laughs> okay, I'm going to continue reading. Um, 15. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter, to go in the, to the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the woman, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her, and when Esther was taken to the king, when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into the royal palace, in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won favor. She won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her, on her head, and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. So for this, I am going to underline. Well, not underline. Circle. Sorry, I forgot to go back in this one. But delighted is what I'm going to circle there. Then I'm also going to circle Abihel and Tebeth. And then I'm just going to continue reading the last few verses. Now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him in these in those days as mordecai was sitting at the king's gate big son and teresh two of the king's eunuchs who guard guarded the threshold became angry and sought to lay hands on king ahasuerus and this came to the knowledge of mordecai and he told it to queen esther and esther told the king in the name of mordecai when the affair was investigated and found to be so the men were both hanged on the gallows and it was recorded in the book of the chronicles in the presence of the king so now going back to verse 12, I'm going to underline, um, no, I'm not going to underline. What am I talking about? I'm going to define, define all of my words. <laughs> so taking this emoji, uh, pad, I'm going to put beautifying Okay, so beautifying refers to the process of purification in which the women would rub their bodies daily with perfumery. Um, and the perfumery were basically oils and scents that they allowed to um, absorb into their skin. So, refers to the process of purification. I think I spelled that wrong, but who cares? Whatever. I did. Did I? Purification? No, I didn't. Okay. Um, in which women would rub body daily with 
with scents. That's what I'm going to put. Terrible handwriting, but whatever. Um, the next I'm going to do is the Myrie. And it's a bitter oil. I'm next going to do... that person's name which I cannot pronounce Shash Gas if I'm pronouncing it I'm gonna say Shash Gas it's what I would say but I don't know because they pronounce it differently um, Persian origin meaning Servants of the Beautiful. He was overseer of concubines, which was the second harem. So the king had two harems. He was that man, I guess, <laughs> as you would say. Um, So, Delight, I actually circled that because um, that definitely means something different. In Hebrew, the word is kafetz, chafetz, I mean, um, and it means for a man to take pleasure, for a man to take pleasure in or desire a woman and this is sexually so the next thing I wanted to do was Abihel or Abihel I don't know how to pronounce it but um, Esther's dad's name it means father my father is my Sorry, you guys, about that sound. And then for to Beth, I'm going to write it here. It basically is the 10th Hebrew month. Which is equivalent to um, December, January. And our modern calendar. So, now going back to the scriptures. Um, now, when the turn came for each woman to go into King Ahasuerus, I'm going to underline turn came for each young woman to go to King Ahasuerus. Um, I'm going to underline after being 12 months under the regulations. I'm going to underline uh, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices. And that's just all verse 12. <laughs> okay, so going to verse 13. Now, actually skipping to verse 14. I'm going to write in the evening. I'm going to underline in the evening she would go in and in the morning she would return. Um, second harem, I'm going to underline, of the concubines. Then I'm going to underline, not go to the king against unless he delighted in her. Skipping to 15, um, I'm going to underline, she asked for nothing except what Haggai advised I'm going to underline Esther was winning favor in all in the eyes of all going to verse 16 um 
I'm going to underline the tenth month which is the month of Tabeth in the seventh year of his reign because this is letting me know this is now four years after um, the removal of Queen Vashti but I'll get to that note in a second 17 she won grace and favor in this in his sight He set the royal crown on her head and made her queen. Skipping to verse 18, I'm going to underline king had a, gave a feast. King gave a great feast. Going to 19, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. I'm just underlining for now. That way I can just go through it. Um, verse 20. I'm going to bracket that because that's important, honestly. Um, well, yeah. I'll just underline Esther had not made known her kindred. Going to 21, in those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. I'm going to underline that. And then skipping down to 23, I'm going to underline. Affair was investigated and found. To be so. And then recorded in the book of the Chronicles. Okay. Now we can dive back into the note taking part and I'm going to have to remove this post it because it's full. Okay. So um verse twelve, sorry, it says turn the turn came for each young woman to go into King Ahasuerus. What I wrote, or what I'm going to write rather is that um, each woman basically had her knight to please the king in his quarters. Every female had their knight, so. Each woman had a knight Yep, Vicky, that's correct. I was definitely going to I was going to get to that when I got to that part um for them cuz it says it in the, yeah, we have the same bible, so yeah. That's where I got my note for that at. But um the verse 12, turn came for each woman to go into the king. Um each woman had a knight to please the king. After being 12 months under the regulations. Um, so it basically took each woman a year to be purified to go before the king. Um, this was a way to get them as beautiful as possible. And some theologians also say this was a way to find out if um, they were pregnant prior to being with the king. Because it's not um, unheard of for women to lie and say that they were virgins back then. Um, but then be pregnant and then sleep with a man and say that the baby is it belongs to that man. Um, they didn't have, you know, the technology and the the medical advancement that we have nowadays where we can just take a DNA test. Um, so that time was just meant for them to um, purify themselves and also a time for them to see if they were really pregnant or not. And um, the process basically included them you know yeah sitting naked over um these little burners that would basically give off the aromas in the sense from the oils um so that it can absorb into the pores into their clothes and it also included cleansing and anointing and rubbing with oils and spices and um possibly even the use of henna i'm not 100% sure about that i did research it and found that out find that out but um i'm not 100% sure about the henna so what I'm going to write is, um, took a year to absorb sweet aromas 
I mean, this would be their type of perfume because with us nowadays, we can just slap some perfume on our neck and it, it could be there all day. With them, they had to really just sit over fire with some charcoal and um, allow the scents to absorb into their pores. So our modern day perfume is very different from their type of perfume. Um, so it took a year to absorb sweet aromas into pores and clothing. Also to ensure none were pregnant. Okay. Going on to where it says six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and an ointment for women. Um, basically, their year of purification was done in two parts. That's really pretty much it. Um, purification done in two parts. And my thoughts is that um, they use the spices during like the winter months, and then they would use the oils. Um, during the uh, spring months um, and yes it definitely does sound uncomfortable I personally couldn't imagine sitting over a charcoal fire pit naked um, in a robe to allow some scent to go into my pores I just one that's gonna be hot um, you're gonna be in an awkward position you can accidentally burn yourself like these women did a lot they did a lot and I don't think I could do it i mean i'm pretty sure i could if i was in that position but i would not want to experience that rather is what i mean to say so going to verse 14 it says in the evening she would go in and in the morning she would return um oh sorry no i'm gonna go to verse 13 um the only thing i really have to say about verse 13 is that every woman had a chance to take one item, be it clothing or jewelry, to the palace, and that one item they would end up taking back with them to the second harem. Everything else would be left um, at the virgin harem, so that, you know, that's pretty much it. But like I said, in the evening she would go in, and in the morning she would return. Um, they were only summoned to pleasure him for but a night, and then returned as useless objects to be with the other women that he slept with. So, um... Only summoned to pleasure so it's kind of like that one night staying kind of feel at least from what I'm getting is that they would go in at night so they would not even see him during the day during the day they would get themselves ready um, and probably pick out that one item that they want to take with them um, so say it be a necklace um, so the you know this female might just get herself all beautiful all pretty put on this gorgeous necklace go see the king for a few hours sleep with this man lose your virginity to him um, not really knowing how the king is personally um, never meet never truly knowing this man so only having slept with him for one night him taking your virginity then right in the morning having to leave and going to live with his other wives or the other people he slept with that is a little awkward um, these women really went through a lot back then um, because that that's that's as I would say reckless <laughs> nowadays but I mean this was actually a part of their culture so um, so then left after as a useless and I'm saying a useless object because it's kind of like he used them and then threw them aside to cast them into um, the concubine harem and I mean some of them may have become wives but I mean he had so many wives you would never really know who was more important so I wouldn't want to be them simply put um, second harem of concubines what did I put for that? Oh, so basically, um, the second harem was uh, 
for the women that had sexual relations with him and were no longer virgins. And this was also where his offspring were kind of raised. Um, and it was separated from the royal palace. So the second harem of concubines. We have virgins who had sexual relations with the king. And I'm going to take a second to highlight because my eyes are starting to hurt. You know, I just realized I did not circle my definitions. <laughs> so, let me do that now. I don't know how I forget to do that. Where is that paper? There it is. I'm just highlighting um, the things that I circled with the notes to match. I knew something was off. <laughs> That's a good question, Vicky. I mean... I always wonder like if these women were petty as like <laughs> we are nowadays in our lives how some women are petty um, because they definitely did share the same man so I wonder if they compared notes and if they were petty and were like he loved me more or you know I don't I really want to know I'm curious to know but the Bible does not disclose that information um, so I guess that's the Lord's way or God's way of telling us that it doesn't matter <laughs> but um yeah, I really do wonder the same thing. I really do. Because that that's a lot of women. Um, I mean, just, he already had about 300 virgins coming in. No telling how many women he already had in the second harem. Or if he had women already in the virgin harem. Like, we have no idea. So, it is uh, mind-blowing, to say the least. Definitely mind-blowing. And I would love to know. Definitely would. Alright. Now I feel better because things are starting to look a little better. It is 11.53. Alright, I'm almost finished. <laughs> so, continuing on with my highlights because that's what I do. Like, in my head, I imagine them fighting and arguing. But then again, I don't think they could fight because they could probably be killed for fighting. So, like, I, I don't, I really wonder. I really, really wonder. That's something I definitely would love to know. Because, like, I feel like lying about the king or anything harmful towards the king or petty, as we call it, um, could ultimately mean their death. I mean, look at Queen Vashti. She refused the king. And they they didn't kill her, but they basically took her position from her. So, that's a good thing. Uh, that that's that's definitely a good point. I would definitely love to know. But um, okay. So, not go into the king unless the unless the king delighted in her. I'm going to use this yellow. 
I know my brother's patiently waiting for me to finish, so I'm gonna try to speed this up. <laughs> so verse 14. Um, she would not go into the king unless the king delighted in her. Basically, the king only called on the woman when he missed them in a sexual manner. Otherwise, they stayed amongst the other women or the other concubines, never freely having the chance to move around the palace because both the harems were in different locations, but they were still on the palace grounds. Yes, Tanya, like, I really feel like they were petty, but they had to be petty on the low because, I mean, anything harming or rudeful about being anything harmful towards or anything said wrong about the king could have been their death so like they really they probably were really petty on the low like i really feel like these women were secretly petty like who had more um who had more kids with the king or who had more time with the king or whatever that i, I don't really know and um that's a good one yep so <laughs> verse 14 not to go into the king unless the king delighted um he only calls on them only called them when he needed to be pleased otherwise they could not freely move about, could not freely move about. I just feel like being a concubine or a part of a harem, in a sense, is basically like being a prisoner. Because you lived in a specific place and had to do specific things. That's how I feel. Um... Going to verse 15, um, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, advised. So for verse 15, I wrote um, that Esther was very humble. She didn't take anything that she didn't need, and um, she respected the advice of the king. Hey, I'm probably going to pronounce your name wrong. Um, Chartis. Let me know if I'm saying that wrong. <laughs> um, but no problem. You can definitely watch it later. All these videos stay up. Um, they're going to stay up forever. Um, unless something happens to Facebook. I also plan to upload all of all 10 of the videos to um, YouTube starting next month. And the first video, there's a file. Um, if you go to the announcement section, there's a file that says um, Esther Bible Study, all links and videos. Go to that and you'll find all of the um, the links to the videos, especially the first one. Because the first video, we had some problems last week with it. But um, I'll also um, comment, not comment, but I'll also tag you in it so you can see it as well. But you can definitely still watch it. Um, it's always going to be up. Okay, so as I was saying, Esther was humble. Was humble and wise. She respected the advice from authority. Yeah, Tanya, they probably would have lived their life like that. Definitely could have. I mean, it's it's really, to me, I feel like it's a lose-lose unless you are the queen. And even being the queen, I mean, you had to accept the fact that your husband would go to other women to please them. So, I don't know. I guess the queen would be winning. But in the end, I mean, are you truly winning? Because your husband's still sleeping with other women that live where you live. So, I don't know. Um, this is also verse 15, yes. The second part for verse 15, um, I have Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all. Um, 
Esther's simplicity made her very extraordinary. That's the simplest way that I can put it. Um, her simple lifestyle made everything seem extraordinary when she was not being extraordinary. She was just simply being herself. And that alone made her... Um, oopsie. And I'm going to try to erase that. Yay, it erases. <laughs> so I'm going to have to figure out a way to work with this highlighter. But, um, there we go. That is not pretty. Let's, yeah, here we go. There we go. It smeared the font a little, but it did erase. But, um, okay, so. Her, some, Esther, um, uh, blah, blah, blah. What I want to put. For that, where it says, um, Esther was winning for favor in the eyes of all, her simplicity made her extraordinary. That's how I see it. Um, made her extraordinary. She was very godly. She didn't need a whole bunch of items with her. She just went with herself, with her looks. And um, she was a very humble person, so I feel like being simple made her extraordinary compared to the others because i'm pretty sure these other women were trying so hard to get the attention of the king whereas she wasn't she was just being herself being her normal you know quiet probably wholesome self and attracted the king so um in the 10th month which is a month of tebeth uh in the seventh year of his reign that is verse 16 and um it basically details that it was four years after the removal of Vashti. So, four years after the removal of Vashti. Moving to verse 17, she won grace and favor in his sight, so he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen. Um, verse 17. I'm just writing down my notes on the post-it note as I say it out loud. Um, because I have my notes typed on my computer. I just don't have them written out. Because, um, I like to do this with you guys on camera. So, I need to figure out a way to use these highlighters. But that's a pretty color. Uh, these are so pretty. This is the, uh, Pilot Friction. These are so stinking gorgeous, you guys. Oh my gosh. I'm going to take this orange one for this one. I wish these had the little pointy tips because it would be easier to highlight with, but it is what it is. And I'm just going in with these colors so that it would be easier for me. I like these colors. I'm obsessed. Officially obsessed. Okay. So for 18. No, sorry. We're still at 17. Um, she won grace and favor in his sight. So he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen. Um, basically, God's plan was beginning to unfold. Esther's beauty and purity made her number one. She was respectful, submissive, obedient, elegant, poised, and had skills befitting a queen she understood authority and was promoted from concubine to wife and queen um i know i just said a lot <laughs> so um she was respectful elegant She definitely was submissive. Um, she understood her role. Befitting a queen. And promoted to wife and queen. I do have a cross reference for that, which is um, Proverbs. 519 and then I also have Genesis 39 and 5 
So I'm going to quickly read Proverbs 5.19. Proverbs 5.19 says, uh, what? Is it really 5.19? Um, yeah. Okay, so it says, a lovely dear, um, actually, no, I'm not going to start because verse 19 starts with some weirdness, so. Verse 19, let her breast fill you at all times with delight, being intoxicated always in her love. So this is saying that um, your wife should, in essence, be the one that you're intoxicated with, the, the one that you should only be going to for satisfaction. At least that's my understanding of it. <laughs> and then 39.5 Genesis. Um, from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessings of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Um, so just from him making Esther his wife, he uh, basically would have had a blessed life, which we all know that he did. But um, we'll get into that further as we read along. But um, moving on to verse 18, the king gave a great feast. Um, yet again, he is being flashy. I don't think he needed to go through great lengths. But um, once again, he is showing off his new wife with food, drinks, and upscale decor. So, showboating. Showboating again. And then moving to 19, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Now, I think this part is interesting because this indicates that um, Mordecai was a man of influence or he was at least associated with men like that because um, I don't think anyone could just roll up to the king's gate you know I feel like if you just rolled up to the king's gate you might have been killed stabbed I don't know executed so Mordecai had to have had some type of influence or known influential people so um, I think that's important to note that so um, indicates he was a man of influence. And I hear my brother is getting impatient. <laughs> there we go. Um, moving on to 20 where it says Esther had not made known her kindred um, even after her being queen she still continued to listen and obey her cousin um, and I mean she she may have have had to had violated some of the Jew, Jewish ceremonial laws now that she was queen of the Persian Empire but um, even in that she still remained faithful to the word of God which is to obey your parents and um, and obey authority and that's what she did so even in her being queen she still obeyed Even after being crowned, she continued to obey Mordecai. have to erase some of this because this is ridiculous erasing over the font is not the best idea but these colors are stunning oh my gosh they're so stunning all right last three verses so going to verse 21 I don't know if you guys put any comments okay um 21 in those days as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate again um this kind of goes back to what I was saying with the other verse in verse 19 so I'm actually going to highlight in that, that in the same color because um he had to have been a man of influence to be sitting at or be that close to the king's gate sorry you guys I thought you guys could see that um That was a little heavy handed. And. Okay. 
So, verse 21 and 22. Um, what I put for these two, this is when Mordecai hears that um, Big Than and Teresh, who are the two of the king's chamberlains, are planning to um, basically do conspire and do treason. Um, basically, I put that Mordecai saves the king from betrayal of his chamberlains. Chamberlains, um, they plan to conspire against the king and commit treason. But he sent word to Esther to the king, and he may have been a Jew, but he still cared for the king as a person, which was a fulfillment of four different scriptures, which um, I'm probably not going to be able to read right now. Actually, I'll quickly read them. I'll try to finish by 12:30. But um, for this, I'm going to write. Mordecai saved King. He was a Jew, but still treated King as person, treated King as a human. And I find that important because um, I'm probably, I don't know if I'm going to offend anybody when I say this, but um what comes to mind when I read that was how a lot of so-called Christians or pastors or people in um, positions at church, they are really rude and negative towards uh, people in the LGBTQ community. And when I say that, I mean when you tell a gay person or a lesbian person that they're going to go to hell. I don't think that... Um, people in that sort of authority should do that simply because we are told in the Bible to love our neighbors as we love ourselves um, and it's not the person like we forget that it's not the person that we should have a problem with it's the sin that we should have a problem with and what people tend to take out of proportion is they automatically equate the sin with the person and that's not the case like you may love your mother but there's something that your mother might not do that you don't approve of you're not going to tell your mother you're going to hell no you're just going to let her know you don't approve of that sin but you're still going to love her you're still going to care for her the same thing goes with i think people in the lgbt community you might not like that they like what they like. You might not like that they like the same sex or whatever the case may be. You might not like that someone changed the way they look because they weren't satisfied. You might not like that, but that's not a reason for you to hate that person. That's not a reason for you to um, treat that person any differently. And that's basically what came to mind when I read what happened in um, verse 21 and 22 because Mordecai didn't have to save the king. Like, at all all he had to do was sit there and be concerned about his cousin um pretty much esther would have been fine whether the king was killed or not that's what i believe and um he didn't have to but him being a person being a man of god that he is he chose to say something to esther and esther told the king and the king was able to have his life spared so um i mean that's just my opinion i know someone might watch this and feel some type of way um Yes, true, Stacey. That's another point. Um, that, that That's basically pretty much what I'm saying. Um, but I, I wanted to use that as an example because I know a lot of people in the church, even some people that I know in my family, are like that. And um, I have gay friends. I have lesbian friends. It is what it is. Um, are they good people? Yes. Do I agree with what they like? Not so much. But I'm not going to sit there and tell them, you're going to go to hell or treat them any different because of what they like. It. I just have to continue to be a light and um, you know I talk scripture with them sometimes we discuss the Word of God um, and you know it's a process but I don't think you should treat people differently because of that but um the scriptures that I have for this are numbers 32 and 23 Job 2027 Proverbs 26, 26, and then I have 1 Peter 2, 17. I'll read those in a second for you guys. Hold on, guys. Let me let my brother know I'm almost done. <laughs>
I just had to let my brother know I was finishing up. But um, I'm going to now read these scriptures to you guys. So, um, I'm so sorry, you guys. <laughs> oh my gosh. In my rush, I completely put the wrong thing. So now I have to fix it. And I feel like this happened last week. So I'm going to bracket this. Because it goes with that, not that. Oh my gosh. Only me. You know, only I do crazy stuff like this. And I'm going to have to change this color. <laughs> this definitely happened last week. I'm just going to use brown for this. Just because it blends a little better. And um, make it work. And I'm going to put an arrow here. There we go. Just got to make it work how it works. Oh, hopefully you guys can see that. Let me turn on the camera. Yeah, so like I made a mistake and put that this verse was for that, but it's not. This um, note here goes to verses 21 and 22. So I just bracketed it and um, just fixed it around to make more sense. <laughs> I swear I'm always doing this at least once or twice in a video. But this is how my studies go. Okay, so for 2122, I'll read it. It says, In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Big Sin and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. So for that first, for them two verses, there's 21 and 22. No worries, Vicky. It's okay. But um, for those two verses, um, I put that Mordecai saved the king. He was a Jew, but still treated the king as a human. And um, and then I have these four scriptures. So the first one is Numbers 32-23. And let's flip to 32-23. I'm going to read it to you guys. I'm not going to show it. But um, it says, what? Oh, 23. I don't know why I went to 32. It says, but if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find out. So this is in regards to um, the two eunuchs with their sin. Um, They're sinning quietly. They're basically sitting there conspiring against the king and they feel like they're not going to be found out but lo and behold scripture tells you that your sins will be found out in numbers 32 23 which again i'll read it says but if you will not do so behold you have sinned against the lord and be sure your sin will find out then i have job 20 27 And that reads, the heavens will reveal his iniquity and the earth will rise up against him. I have Proverbs 26, 26. Proverbs 26, 26 reads, though his hatred be covered with deception... His wickedness will be exposed in the assembly. And then 1 Peter 2.17, which is actually something that um, Mordecai lived out. If I can flip to it. 1 Peter. See, I haven't really flipped through this Bible as much. So the pages are like stuck. But um First Peter's First Peter two seventeen says, Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. So we know that Mordecai, he loved God, he was a man of God. We know that um and he honored the king. He honored uh as it says the emperor who was um a hazardous. Um, so he definitely stuck true to the scripture and for Job 20, 27 and Proverbs 26, 26, um, as well as Numbers 32 and 23, that more so relates to Big Sin and Teresh and how they were going to be caught because of Mordecai. So now moving on to affair was investigated and to be, sorry, 
um, when the affair was investigated and found to be so, um, I put that the sins of the Chamberlains were exposed, and that again goes back to those verses. So I'm going to just rewrite those verses. Um, sins in treason exposed. And again, that goes back to Numbers 32-23, Job 20-27, and Proverbs 26-26. Alright, the final verse final final verse that we have is recorded in the book of the Chronicles and um, Mordecai's actions were written down for future reference his actions written for future reference to be rewarded okay okay so recorded in the book of the Chronicles his actions were written for future reference to be rewarded and if you guys don't know um, he definitely does get rewarded down the line as trouble ensues when Haman gets involved but um, yeah that is pretty much it all of my fabulous notes that I have for today I'm gonna show you guys real quick these are all of the notes from today so four post-it notes worth of notes all of the notes um, and quickly I just want to read some things to you guys that I wrote out um, so basically chapter 2 brings Esther and Mordecai to the forefront of God's plan to save his people in motion. Um, we have Esther who is beautiful. Um, she's not only gorgeous on the outside, but um, her true core values on the inside, which are uh, humility, kindness, respect, submissiveness, obedience, are also beautiful. Um, we also see Mordecai, who is a Jewish man who greatly loves his cousin, save a pagan king, when he didn't have to, which sets the ball in motion for God to do his work through the both of them. So though the, the story focuses on Esther, there's also an importance to Mordecai in this story. As you guys can see, his name is mentioned quite a lot. And um, the two of them are mentioned, but again, overall, the story is really about God and his providential hand and how he um, protected and saved his people. Um, and though God is not mentioned, you can see his hand, basically what I was just saying, though God's hand, um, though God is not mentioned, you can see his providential hand and how favored Esther was among those in the palace. Um, she basically emitted such a light that people gravitated towards her and she's the example of John 12 and 6, which I will quickly read because I actually was, um, reading that as a devotional the other day and it's crazy how that just aligned with that. So, John 12 and 6, 12 and 6, I'm going to quickly read to you guys. Twelve and six says, um, no, it's not John 12 and 6, Where, what? Or was it 6 and 12? Okay, give me a quick second, you guys, to look through my notes because I did it as a devotional and it really stood out to me um, so this was the devotional from Monday let me find that book okay. so the scripture is John 12 36 I don't know why I put six so sorry about that so I'm gonna read John 12 36 for you guys and that's my stomach, and that is not the best sound ever. Uh, John 12, 36 reads, While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Um, and this was something that Jesus told the men. I think he told this to the disciples, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 
or he was he was talking to either his disciples or the people around him um but he was saying that if you have the light believe in the light that you may become sons of light now the light we all know that jesus is the light he is the truth the light and the way um and to become sons of light that basically means that um we believe in jesus but in this instant there was no jesus so for esther it was god so she would believe in god and then the qualities and characteristics and the nature of her would become evident in her life so um i hope that just made sense i feel like i'm saying it wrong but um esther basically emitted such a light that she basically had people gravitate towards her um which again goes back to her name being esther which is star in persian and um the last thing is that esther was a very submissive person in regards to mordecai Haggai and also later on the king submission was her choice um, and she must have known that submission ultimately was her trust in God's providence um, because none of this probably would have went as smoothly as it did if Esther was not a submissive person but um, uh, that is it for now pretty much um, thankfully this study went smoothly there was no interruptions with the phones or anything. But um, pretty much it for today's study of Chapter 2 for Esther. I am going to have the live notes up by 1.30. Um, I'm just going to edit a few things. And then I'm going to also have the questions posted as well as a little photo for us to discuss Chapter 2. And um, I'm also going to find those links for these highlighters because I absolutely love all of these highlighters i do i really do guys like these highlighters are stunning and i'm probably gonna have to get more i'm gonna have to find a way to work with the pilot frictions um in the bible but um the colors are stunning so thanks don <laughs> thank you lorraine thank you lazoya Oh, I'm just seeing your um your comment, Penny. But yeah, I, I wish people did think that way as well. But unfortunately, um, people take scripture and abuse it, which is um, I actually just had this conversation with my pastor because I told my first lady, um, what I was doing. Um, I I like to go to my first lady a lot because she is my spiritual mother and she's helped me a lot as well as my pastor. And I recently told her about the you know the things that I was doing, and her and my bishop prophesied to me about some stuff, and um. You know, I told her, I don't like to call Daughter of Increase a ministry, but she told me that it is a ministry, but I hate saying the word ministry. And I don't mean to say hate, because hate is a bad word. Um, not a bad word, but a strong word. But um, it's not, I, I just don't like how people misuse the word ministry. So I didn't want to call it a ministry. But when I speak to my first lady, she always calls it my ministry. And um, I don't even like to say that I'm teaching because people take teaching out of context and they take scripture out of context and it's a lot so when it comes to certain things i like to um not say the word ministry or that i'm teaching something because it feels i don't know it feels awkward with how i know some people who have um abused and misused the words um but yeah i i, I wish people thought the same way but unfortunately they don't people will be people and um you have good, you have evil. It's just the way of the world. But um, do you guys have any questions? I'm going to try to stick all these post-it notes somewhere. They're going to go somewhere because... I need to take a photo of all of these notes. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm going to stick this here. All right, guys. So I'm going to end it here, and I'll see you guys next week for the next session, which will be Chapter 3. So I definitely would say read through Chapter 3. It's only 15 verses, so read through it. Take your notes. Um, and if you guys don't mind i would appreciate if you guys would take some photos and just share them in the group because i love seeing photos it makes me so happy
You're welcome, Pamela, and thank you so much for watching and supporting. Thank you to everyone who watches and support. Um, I'm a very shy person. I'm a shy person, but I'm also outgoing. Um, and it's still nerve-wracking for me. I've been doing, I've been making YouTube videos for a long time, since 2009. But um, doing live videos freaks me out sometimes. It really makes me scared. <laughs> but um, I'm slowly but surely getting the hang of it, and I'm enjoying it. But um, I definitely would say read through chapter three and um, share photos of the notes that you guys are doing, um, and stuff like that. And pretty much that's it. So I'll see you guys in the next study. Bye, ladies.